So, thermochemistry, this will be the last topic for test one. Okay. So, um, thermochemistry deals with measurements of heat of reaction. Okay. So, when a reaction occurs, uh, what happens is the temperature of the products will momentarily be different from the original temperature of the reactants. So, as a result of that, what happens? Well, it's going to be temporarily be hotter or colder than the surroundings, so there's going to be heat flow, right? So heat flow will occur between the reaction mixture and the surrounding, and eventually that will restore the temperature of your reaction mixture back to the original temperature. The amount that heat that flows for that to happen is called the heat of reaction, okay? So, uh, let's look at this example question right here. Suppose you have a reaction in aqueous solution, you carry it out under constant pressure of 750 torr, and the reaction produces 0.5 moles of gaseous products. Assume those gaseous products are ideal, behaving ideally. And in the process, absorbs 326 kilojoules of heat to revert back to its initial temperature of 314 Kelvin. So what's our Q here? Positive or negative? It absorbs, so positive 326 kilojoules, okay? What's our W going to be? This is, this reaction is carried out at constant external pressure, so uh, your work is going to be equal to negative P external times delta V. Our P external is 750 torr, so 750 uh, let's change that to atmosphere, over 760 atmospheres times, what's the change in volume? Okay, you have a reaction. Okay, so here's your reaction mixture to begin with. You can imagine, let's say, let's cover this up so that there's an external pressure of one atmosphere there, uh, 750 torr, okay? So what will happen when the gas is produced? That piston right there is going to move, right? So what will be the change in volume? The change in volume essentially is the moles of gas, the volume of the gas produced, right? So your delta V here is the volume of the gas produced. There's going to be a minimal change in volume of the actual solution okay, there's, uh, compared to the actual change in volume due to the amount of gas produced. So what's our delta V here? If you're assuming we have an ideal gas, then delta V is the volume of the gas produced, so it's nRT over P, right? The volume is equal to nRT over P. So let me calculate that. Let's scroll down here. Volume of the gas produced, so you say delta V is equal to the change in the volume of the gas from, okay, to a very good approximation. So that's just equal to the volume of the gas produced here. So that's equal to nRT over P, okay. And the reason I didn't go ahead and calculate the pressure in atmosphere is because now I know I can just cancel it. So work is minus P external, okay, delta V. And P external is just going to be the same pressure as the gas. So it's minus P times nRT over P. So P cancels out. So that's just going to be minus nRT. So how many moles of gas do we have? We produced half a mole of gas times RT. What's RT? Uh, let's just use kilojoules since we are using kilojoules for our heat. Right? So what's R for in, kilo, in kilojoules? 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. And our temperature here is 314 Kelvin. So 
you're assuming you're carrying it out in a in a something like maybe a hot water bath that's a 314 kelvin okay warm water bath so what's our work here let's calculate it so it's 0.5 times 8.314 times 314 oops oh, 0.5 times 8.314 times 314 that is 13.05, so 1.31 kilojoules, negative 1.31 kilojoules, okay? All cancels out, Kelvin cancels out. So that's your W, negative 1.31 kilojoules. So let me do that here. Negative 1 point, so this is positive, what, 326 kilojoules, negative 1.31 kilojoules. What's the delta U for this process? Formula for delta U is, first law, Q plus W. So plus 326 kilojoules plus negative 1.31 kilojoules. And that gives us... 26 minus 1.31 uh, what did I do 326 uh, 326 minus 1.31 is 324.69 okay so given the sig figs it's just going to be 325 right probably should keep an extra one so let's just say what was that 324.7 what's our delta H this is constant pressure so what's delta H it's just equal to Q and it's just going to be positive 326 kilojoules the heat of reaction at constant pressure is just equal to delta H. Okay. Right. So, in general, okay, uh, you'll notice in general, uh, here we said work is just uh, equal to negative nRT because this is a reaction that produces a gas. So your, your reaction mixture expands. In general, your work will just be equal to negative delta N gas RT if you're doing your reaction at constant pressure, okay? Because, why? It's just going to be negative P external, which is going to be the pressure, times, okay, uh, delta N gas RT over P. Your P will just cancel out, okay? Let's see if we start another example. A reaction mixture in a fixed volume container leading to a, uh, occurs in a fixed volume container leading to a temperature increase. The system releases 415 kilojoules of heat in order to revert back to the original temperature. So that's called your heat of reaction. So uh, what is Q here? Since it releases 415 kilojoules, it's going to be negative 415 kilojoules. What's our work here? Fixed volume, delta V is zero, so work is zero. So what's our Q? Q plus W, which is negative 415 kilojoules. So you can see that your heat of reaction, if you do it at constant volume, is going to be equal to delta U. So heat of reaction will be the delta U. That will be the amount of heat that would have to transfer between system and surroundings in order to restore the products back to the same temperature as the original reaction. See, when you carry out a reaction, okay, because of a change in potential energy, your products will now be momentarily higher or lower in temperature than the original reactants. That would lead to heat flow between system and surroundings. If I want to know what's delta H, what would I have to do? 
it's not going to be equal to Q this time. Delta H is what? Delta H. What's the definition of H? It's U plus PV, right? So delta H is equal to delta U plus delta PV. Okay? And so that's delta U plus P initial, V in, B, B final, V final minus P initial, V initial. So you know your delta U, right? And V final and V initial is the same, so I can just factor that out as V. And P final minus P initial is delta P. Well, do I know my volume and do I know my change in pressure? I don't have enough information there, so here there's not enough information given, okay? Now, how do we measure heats of reaction? What we do in the lab is we carry out the reaction in a container that is thermally insulated. So it's got adiabatic walls. That kind of container is called a calorimeter. Okay, so this is thermally insulated. And then we just measure the change in the temperature when the reaction occurs in the calorimeter. So that's delta T. Okay, so here's a way to visualize what happens. So you start off with separated reactants, okay? You put them together in your calorimeter. Okay, since your calorimeter is insulated, Q for that process, in going from separated reactants at temperature T1 to mixed products in the calorimeter, okay? So this is in the calorimeter. To go from separated reactants, put them together, get to mixed products already at a now at a different temperature in the calorimeter. Q for that is zero. Why? You didn't you didn't put it in contact with anything hot or cold, right? In fact, you're preventing heat flow between system and surroundings. So Q for that process is zero. Okay. Now, uh, the heat of reaction, what we call the heat of reaction, is the amount of heat that would have to that we would have to allow to flow between system and surroundings to restore it to the original temperature. So, if I want my products back to the same temperature as my reactants, back to T1, okay, I would now have to imagine. Okay, removing the adiabatic walls, allowing heat to flow in, and calculating how much heat would I need to restore my product's temperature back to the same temperature as the original reactants. Well, that's the formula for that is simple. There's no, there's no chemical change here, right? For this imaginary process, where, for this process that we're imagining. We're simply taking our mixed products, which is at a different temperature now than the surroundings, back to the original temperature of the reactants, which is still the same as the temperature of the surroundings. So uh, Q will just be the heat capacity times, we have to reverse the temperature change. So instead of delta T, you're going to have negative delta T. We define delta T as T2 minus T1. So we have to reverse the temperature change. So we have to say the heat of reaction is equal to the heat capacity, okay? This is of the system, okay? This is your reaction mixture and the immediate surroundings multiplied by the reverse, the inverse of the delta, the reverse of the delta T. So negative delta T to get your original product, uh, your product at the same temperature as the original reaction. So your heat of reaction, this is the most important equation in calorimetry. Heat of reaction is minus C delta T. Okay. But you have to keep in mind that delta T is the, the delta T that you actually measured when you carried out the reaction. Okay. The negative of that delta T is the delta T that you're imagining to take your products back from its temp, uh, from its original temp, from its final temperature, back to its original temperature, back to the original temperature of the reactants. All right. So to measure. Heat of reaction, you carry out your reaction in insulated vessel, you measure T delta T, which is T2 minus T1. Okay. Your working equation for your 
uh, calorimetry experiment is the heat of reaction is equal to negative C times delta T. Your C is the heat capacity of the calorimeter and its contents. Okay? The heat capacity of the calorimeter is called the calorimeter constant. And then the contents would just be your product mixture. So you just add the heat capacity of your calorimeter and the heat capacity of your product mixture. Now, for most, so, uh, for a lot of reactions that we do, we do them in dilute aqueous reaction, aqueous solutions. The heat capacity of your product mixture will just be approximately the heat capacity of the water that you're using. Okay, because a small amount of solute was not going to change your heat capacity of water very much. So that's a very good approximation. So here's an example. You have dilute aqueous solutions originally at 25 degrees. So you have two solutions at 25 degrees. Okay. Uh, so this one and that one, you mix them together in a styrofoam cup, like you did in your freshman lab. And the total volume of the mixture is 100 mils. And the temperature rose from 25 degrees to 27 degrees. What's the heat of reaction? How can we estimate? What's our formula? Q reaction equals negative C times delta T. What's our C? Well, what's our delta T? That's the easier one. It went from 25 to 27. 2.0 degrees Celsius. What's our heat capacity? Approximately that of water. What is the heat capacity of 100 mils of water? That's approximately 100 grams, right? So that's 100 grams times what's the specific heat of water? 4.18 joules per degree Celsius per gram. So grams cancel out, degrees Celsius cancel out. This gives us a heat capacity, a heat of reaction equal to. This is 418 times 2, negative 836 joules. Should it be negative? Well, the temperature went up. So now, if you imagine heat, if you're allowing heat to flow, heat would have to flow out of your reaction mixture, right? So when you mix two things, you mix two reactants and the temperature went up, that tells you you have what's, uh, that, that tells you that you have a reaction that generates heat, you say. So we say that's an exothermic reaction, okay? So the temperature went up, then that's an exothermic reaction. This is a reaction that will lead to heat flowing out of your reaction mixture to the surroundings. Okay, here's another example. Reaction, 150 mils of A, aqueous solution of A, and 50 mils of aqueous solution of B, carry it out in a styrofoam cup. That's your estimated, uh, that's your approximate, uh, for approximation for an adiabatic uh, walls, okay? Temperature drop by 0.95 Kelvin. What if the heat of reaction is known to be 0 0.800 kilojoules? What's the calorimeter constant? So this, illustrates how you can determine calorimeter constant in the lab. You carry out a reaction for which you know what the heat of reaction is. Okay, so Q reaction in this case is positive 0 0.800 kilojoules is given. Okay. And but what do we know about Q reaction? It's equal to negative C times delta T. What do we know from this question? What's our delta T? It's negative 0.95 Kelvin, right? Negative because the temperature dropped. So we can calculate our C, right? Because we know our Q reaction is positive 0.800 kilojoules. So let me solve for C here. C equals negative Q reaction divided by delta T. So but that is what? That is C of your calorimeter plus C of your contents, right? So what am I looking for? C of calorimeter, the calorimeter constant. So I can solve for my calorimeter constant. 
So calorimeter constant is equal to what? Negative Q reaction over delta T minus C of the contents. So what would be our Q reaction here? What was it? Negative 0 0.800 kilojoules. 0 0.800 kilojoules divided by our delta T, which is, I'm sorry, that's, yeah. So that's, that negative is this negative right here, right? Our Q is positive, okay? And our delta T is negative 0.95. What's the heat capacity? Oops, minus. What's the heat capacity of our contents? Approximately that of water, which is going to be 150 plus 50. That's about what? It's about 200 mils of water, right? So that's about 200 grams. So 200 grams of water times 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Gram cancels out. That's 200 times 4.18. 836. So minus 836 joules per Kelvin. And what is this first part right here? 0.8 divided by 0.95. Calculator. 0.8 divided by 0.95 is 0.84 kilojoules. So that would be 842 kilojoules. Okay. I mean 842 joules per Kelvin. Right, so that gives us 842 minus 836, it's about 6 joules per Kelvin, that's your calorimeter constant. Okay. Typically when you run reactions in a calorimeter, you want to make sure your the heat of reaction, uh, the, calor, the heat capacity of your contents, you want that to be significantly larger than your calorimeter constant. Okay. So and that's how you determine the calorimeter constant. Alright, so the reaction we say is exothermic if the reaction mixture, the temperature of the reaction mixture increases as the reaction occurs. And we explained this earlier. Why is that? Temperature increase would make your reaction mixture hotter than the surroundings. So heat would have to flow out of your reaction mixture until your system and the surroundings will be at the same temperature again. Okay? So conversely, your endothermic reaction would be one where if you mix two reactants and the temperature went down, that means an endothermic reaction. As a result of that temperature drop, heat has to flow in from the surroundings because your reaction mixture is now going to be momentarily colder than the surroundings. Okay. So here, dilute aqueous solutions originally at 25 degrees are mixed in a styrofoam cup the reaction the temperature rose to 27.0 degrees celsius is this exothermic or endothermic temperature went up exothermic okay. same reaction we talked about earlier temperature dropped by 0.95 so exothermic or endothermic Endothermic. So Q of your reaction here is positive, remember? And the Q of this reaction here was negative. Okay. So which of the following describes an exothermic reaction? A, B, C, or D? Exothermic reaction Q is positive or negative? Negative. So it can be A. And exothermic reaction, the delta T is going to be positive. So it can be this one. The right answer is C. Reaction for the combustion of natural gas is, okay, if you burn methane in your Bunsen burner, 
Is that an exothermic or endothermic reaction? The products are hotter than the surroundings. That's why you can use it to heat things up, right? So it's exothermic. Uh, so it's ex it's not endothermic. Uh, Q of reaction is positive or negative. Exothermic. Q is it has to flow out, right? If you want to restore those products back to the original temperature. So, exothermic. <clears throat> All right. Heat of neutralization of sodium hydroxide by, H by HCl is exothermic. Algebraic sign of the heat of reaction is negative. Let's talk about reaction enthalpy. Reaction enthalpy is given by the symbol delta H with an R between, as a subscript between the delta and the H. That's the that's the standard symbol for delta H. You may have seen this given as delta H sub R or delta H sub Rxn in uh, earlier courses. The standard way of uh, symbolizing that is putting the R between the delta and the H, okay? The precise definition of reaction enthalpy is it's the change in enthalpy associated with a fictitious process at constant temperature and pressure where your initial state is separated reactants and your final state is separated products. In other words, if I have reactant one, reactant two, I get the H for that. If for some way, if there was a way for me to determine the H of the reactants, okay, add them up and then separate, uh, let's separate separate reactants and then products, let's say P1 and P2, I can get the H for the products, okay. The difference in the H, the delta H, is the delta H for the reaction. Both reactants and products are going to be separated at the same temperature. Okay? Now, uh, of course, that's hard to do. So a practical definition, it turns out, to a good, very good approximation in a lot of cases, that delta H just happens to be equal to the heat of reaction. Okay? And that's probably the reason, rational why enthalpy is given the symbol H. Okay? So, uh, it's common to hear people talk of delta H as delta heat or change in heat. That's not really, H doesn't really stand for heat. It stands for enthalpy. That's a symbol for enthalpy. But it, if since we're doing most of our reactions at constant pressure, the change in enthalpy happens to be equal to the heat of reaction at constant pressure. All right. So, let's imagine what happens here? You've got separated reactants, and then you have take your that's your initial state, separated products, which is your final state. Okay? To go from initial state to the final state, the change in the enthalpy is called delta H sub R, or, or the reaction enthalpy. Well, like I said, that's an imaginary process. We can't really we can't really carry that out. It's very hard to do it. So what we do is to measure that difference. Okay, what we do in the lab is we actually do a calorimetry experiment. So we mix our reactants, okay, and we end up with mixed products inside a calorimeter. So Q for that first step is zero. Then we imagine taking our products, okay, <laughs> allowing heat to flow between our product mixture and the surroundings so that uh, your, you can measure the Q for that. So now you have products, mixed products at the original temperature. And so this is, we talked about this earlier. That's your heat of reaction right there. And that's going to be equal to delta H for this step, okay? Delta H for this step. So let, if we call this step one, delta H for step one is zero. Delta H for step two is this heat of reaction, okay? Um... <clears throat> and then we have to do one last step. We now have to unmix our product. So delta H for, let's call this step three, is the delta H for the unmixing of the products. Okay. And this is something we have to assume is zero if we are going to say that delta H is equal to Q of reaction. So this is going to be zero. Q for the unmixing is zero. What would allow us to assume that the Q for the unmixing is zero? If your reaction 
is such that the limiting reactant is 100% consumed. Why is that? Imagine the reverse. What if you were you have this reaction, you carry it out, okay? All the limiting reactant is consumed. Now imagine the reverse. You have you have your separated products, put them together. What will happen? Nothing, right? So no reaction. So Q for the reverse is going to be zero. Q for mixing of the products would be zero. So that th these are this is the case where you can assume that the Q for that unmixing is zero. So in essence, then, for practical purposes, then we can say that the delta H for the reaction is just equal to the delta H for cooling your product mixture back down to the original temperature of the reactants. Okay, so that's your heat of reaction. Um, now you can actually measure that. Okay, you might say, how did we figure out uh, Remember we said we have to have a known reaction to get the calorimeter constant. How did we know the delta H for that known reaction to begin with? You can actually measure this one uh, directly. How do you measure that directly? Let's say, uh, let's say the temperature got hot. T2 is greater than T1. Actually, let's, let's start something simpler. Let's say the temperature went down. So let's say T2 is less than T1. So now I have here in my calorimeter a cold mixture, right? A T2. How do I measure the amount of heat that I would need to bring it back to the original temperature, to bring it back to T1? What I can do is I can stick an electrical heater in there, okay? So electrical heating. So the electrical work is just going to be equal to to restore that mixture. So I'm not going to let heat flow into it. I'm going to keep it adiabatic still. But now I'm going to stick an electrical heater in there and measure the amount of electrical work I need to restore that temperature to the temperature of the reaction. So what's the formula for electrical work? Voltage times current times time. If we're maintaining the same power, the same voltage and the same current, just multiply that by time that would give you your Q of your reaction. Okay, so uh, once you know at least one reaction that has a known delta H, then you can use that to, cali uh, as to calibrate any other calorimeter. So you don't have to do the electrical heating every time. But if you really want to directly measure the, uh, the delta H of reaction, you, you, know, you don't have to standardize your calorimeter. You can use an electrical heater to determine the delta H of your reaction. Now, what if your temperature actually went up? What would you have to do? Let it cool down to T1, right? So cool to T1 by removing the adiabatic walls, okay? Or just open it up, let it, uh, you don't have perfect adiabatic wall anyway. So open up your calorimeter, let it cool back down to room temperature, T1. And then what do you do? You do electrical work again, right? So you electrically heat it back to T2. And so you know that Q reaction in this case is just equal to negative of the electrical work, right? It's just negative of VIT. It's negative because you know if temperature went up, then that, that should have been an exothermic reaction. In other words, imagine the reverse process over here. So, standard reaction enthalpy. When we attach the uh, adjective standard in front of reaction enthalpy, what we mean, uh, we usually put, we, we, what we do is we put a superscript zero here in the symbol for delta H, okay? And Standard simply means that we have set the constant pressure to be one bar, okay? Uh, in the old days, that was one atmosphere. In freshman chemistry textbooks, they still use one atmosphere as a standard pressure, okay? So that, that's the reaction enthalpy. And this is usually something you attach to a chemical equation, okay? And so this value is the value of the delta H for the moles of reactants and products 
as indicated by the coefficient in your balance equation. And unless otherwise specified, you're dealing with the process where the initial temperature and the final temperature is 298 Kelvin, 25 degrees Celsius. So this is your standard temperature. Now, if you're dealing with a different temperature, you can specify the temperature. So for example, you can say delta H not at 500 Kelvin. Okay, unless otherwise specified, the temperature that's uh, you're dealing with that you're dealing with is 298 Kelvin. Okay, so that's what standard reaction enthalpy means. Okay, so I'm, like I said, that standard reaction enthalpy is typically uh, you typically typically find that attached to a chemical equation, and when when that's attached to a chemical equation, you have what's called a thermochemical equation. So, for example, if you look at the combustion of hydrogen, two moles of hydrogen with one mole of oxygen to give two moles of liquid water, the standard reaction enthalpy for that is negative 571 kilojoules. So, this is the amount if two moles of H2 were involved, one mole of O2 were involved, and two moles of H2 were formed. Okay. Now, it, this is a term, second equation right here is a thermochemical equation if you're making a gas instead of a liquid. Okay, negative 483.7 kilojoules. Note that in your thermochemical, thermochemical equation, you must specify the physical states of the reactants and products. You can see here, it makes a difference what kind of product you're making uh, in this, even though formulas of the reactants and products are the same, right? So, you have to specify whether you're dealing with a solid, liquid, gas, or with your aqueous, with an aqueous solution. Now, if your reactant happens to be a solid, okay, or a product, it happens to be a solid, and it's known to exist in more than one crystalline form, you must specify the form. So, for example, carbon can be in the form of graphite. You have to specify graphite, or it can be in the form of diamond. So if you're burning diamond, for example, then you have to specify C, and then open parenthesis diamond. Okay. So let's consider this hypothetical reaction right here. 3x plus y gives you 2z. Since it's hypothetical, I'm not, I'm not specifying solid, liquid, or gas. This is just for, I'm trying to test on something here. Okay, so something else here. So let's say your delta H standard enthalpy of reaction is negative 75 kilojoules. What's the reaction enthalpy if only 0.9 moles of gas is consumed? Well, this negative 75 corresponds to how many moles of x? Three moles. So you can use that as a conversion factor. So if, if you only need, if your actual reaction in the lab involved only 0 0.90 moles of x, then you say 0 0.90 moles of x times okay, negative 75 kilojoules for three moles of x. Okay. And that gives us what is it? 0.9 over 3 times 75. 0.9 times 75 divided by 3, 22.5. So negative 22.5 kilojoules. If you're going to go by sig figs, this is two sig figs. This is infinite sig figs. That's two sig figs. So it's negative 22, 23. Round to the nearest even. Okay. Negative 22 kilojoules. All right. But if you made that negative 23, I won't. I will make a fast. All right. Consider the hypothetical reaction. 2A plus B yields C. Let's say you measure the heat of reaction in the experiment, okay? And, but in your experiment, you only consume 0.2 moles of A, and you measure the heat of reaction to be negative 5 kilojoule. What's our reaction enthalpy? Negative 5 kilojoules. That's the heat of reaction. What's the standard reaction enthalpy? The one that you have to attach to this equation. It's going to be what? Negative 5.0 kilojoules for 0 0.20 moles of A, right? 
but we want the delta H for two moles of A, so it's going to be 10 times as much, right? So I just say multiply this by two moles of A in your balance equation. So moles of A cancel out. So we say that's negative 50 kilojoules. You can say that there's two moles of A per mole of reaction. Okay. So you say one mole of reaction involves the consumption of two moles of A. So it's negative 50 kilojoules per mole of reaction. By the way, if you do see kilojoules per mole as a unit here in your thermochemical equation, that mole there doesn't refer to any particular reactant or product. It's moles of reaction. Okay, so one mole of reaction, we say, involves two moles of A here, one mole of B, and one mole of C. Okay? Keep that in mind. You, if you see kilojoules per mole attached to a thermochemical equation, that mole, unless it explicitly says moles of whatever, if it doesn't specify moles A, moles B, or whatever, then it means moles of the reaction. Okay? So here... What's the reaction enthalpy for the combustion of four moles of H2? Two moles would be negative 571.6 kilojoules. So what's for four moles? Twice as much. Okay, so you can say 4.00 moles of H2 times negative 571.6 kilojoules for two moles of H2. Twice as much. What about 6.06 .06 grams? Oh, so that should be 6 grams of H2. What would you have to do? Convert grams to moles. How do you change grams to moles? 1 mole H2 is 2.016 grams of H2. Times negative 571.6 kilojoules for two moles of H2. Okay? That would be your delta H for the combustion of H2. Bond calorimetry. If you were to determine heats of combustion, uh, typically you do it in a constant volume container. At constant volume okay so you have a stainless steel container uh, sealed okay and that's called a bomb so when you do heats of combustion measurements in the lab you do it using bomb calorimeter okay so your heat of reaction is just going to be equal in this case to be delta u of the reaction not delta h of the reaction remember constant volume heat of reaction is, is delta u Constant pressure, heat of reaction is delta H. So, uh, how do you determine delta H? If you're interested in delta H, then you just use the definition of H, which is U plus PV. So, delta H is delta U plus delta PV. Right? And like I said earlier, if V is constant, then delta PV is just V times delta P. Right. And what's delta V delta P? You can assume uh, ideal behavior for your gas is in there. So if you make that assumption, then V delta P is just going to be delta N gas times RT. Why is that? V delta P, V, P final minus P initial, right? So N final gas RT over... V, right, minus N initial RT over V. Your volume is constant, so your volume cancels out. So that's N final RT, okay, volume cancels out, minus N initial RT. And that gives you delta N gas times RT. If you have a change in moles of any liquid or solid, that's hardly going to affect, affect your pressure. It's the gas that affects the pressure. And so that V delta P would be delta N gas R2. So that's your approximate delta H. 
that you can calculate from delta u and delta m cancer. Okay? Now, to get the actual standard delta h, all right, you have to make an assumption, you have to make corrections. So you have your delta h for the actual reaction that you carried out in the lab. Now you have to imagine your reactants are at one bar. Figure out what delta h uh, will be if you were to convert it to your reactants at whatever experimental conditions you have, the pressure under, under the experimental conditions. Then imagine you're carrying out the delta H, uh, carrying out the reaction, okay, so that you get products at the experimental condition, okay, and this is this is what you measure, right? And then for your products under the experimental conditions, if you know what the pressure of the product is, imagine taking those products back down to one bar pressure. Okay? And so that's how you would have to do it. And then you actually need to do one final correction here because you have to imagine, actually, you have, you have to imagine your R being ideal, okay, at one bar to turn it into a real gas at one bar and then your pressure your product if it's a gas okay, at one bar change it to product at one bar behaving ideally so that's that's actually the sequence of calculations you would have to do in order to arrive at a value for the standard delta h okay so a good approximation it's mostly that it's mostly what you measure in your experiment but there if you want more precise values for your standard delta h then then you'll have to include these additional corrections. So we'll deal with that uh, later, but for now, let's just focus on the simple cases. All right, so what if you have this, this reaction? Combustion of methane, CH4 plus 2O2 gives you 2CO2 plus 2H2O liquid. Let's say I did this in a bomb calorimeter. Okay, you measure your delta H to be X. What is our delta, I mean delta U to be X? This is your heat of reaction, okay? What's our delta H? What was our formula? Delta U plus delta N gas, RT, right? So what's our delta U? It's X. What's our delta N gas? Okay, how many moles of gas do we have after the reaction? one mole of gas. How many moles of gas do we have before? Three. So delta N gas is one minus three, negative two. Negative two RT. So your delta H for this reaction is whatever the delta U is, is X minus two RT. And typically numbers you, 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 uh, you get for these, I given kilojoules per mole if you look them up. So, what's RT at room temperature? So that's a number you should you need to be familiar with. I keep telling you, RT at room temperature is approximately how much? 25 kilojoules per mole, right? 2.5 kilojoules. Per mole. Okay. 25, uh, 2.5 kilojoules. Per mole. So in this case, it will be lower, your delta H will be lower by how much? More negative by how much? Five kilojoules per mole, five kilojoules, okay. Now, there are some limitations for calorimetry. It obviously is not gonna work for all reactions. Why? What major assumption did we make that a lot? Okay. Yes, yeah, so it only works for a reaction where that goes to that goes to completion, where your limiting reactant goes all the way to completion. Okay. Now your limiting reactant is 100% consumed. The reaction has to be fast. What happens if it's not fast? Now, if it takes a million years for it to happen, then you can't measure it, right? Or uh, if it's too fast, too slow, that you know the heat loss to the surroundings is faster than the rate at which the reaction is happening, then you're not going to make a significant measurement of significant temperature difference. Okay? Like I said, reaction must be complete, right? 
limiting reactant must be used up completely. Otherwise, you'd have to worry about how much reactants were actually consumed, right? And this is the big thing right here. Q for the unmixing would not be equal to zero. So you can't really equate your heat of reaction to delta H or delta U. And there must be no side reactions. Why? You have to know what react what actually happened there, right? So if you have multiple reactions going on, you don't you don't know how much of that heat can be attributed to this reaction and how much to the other reaction. So it has to be just one reaction happening in your calorimeter. All right, so if you cannot measure delta H for all reactions, only for some reactions, then what would you have to do for those that are not suitable for calorimetry? How much time do we have? We've got five minutes to go or are we done? This is it. Huh? Yeah, so we'll, we'll continue this next time.